Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. This is the second in our risk management series of, uh, of webinars. Today's session is going to be on property risk profile changes. My name is Charlie Netherton. I'm the Head of Client Advisory Services at Marsh and I'm joined today by Darren Holmes who's our Head of Operational Risk Consulting. Today's webcast recommends practical steps, considerations and tips to help keep facilities safe and secure during their temporary closure. As buildings and properties become increasingly unoccupied, is it worth considering the risks to vacant and semi-vacant buildings? Our systems, sprinklers, security, access control and, and fire safety systems being maintained. Today we'll discuss why proactively managing this and considering insurance renewal requirements should not be left to chance. As I mentioned, today is the second session in a series of risk management webinars. On Monday, many of you joined us for our session on managing employers' liability during the crisis. And next week, we've got two more sessions on risk profile changes in the new world on Tuesday at noon and maximizing recovery from the COVID pandemic. At the end of today's session, there'll be a Q&A and throughout the session, you can submit any questions you have through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, please, I want to encourage you to get involved in today's, uh, in today's uh, debate. Um, we will look to answer as many of your questions as possible uh, towards the end of the programme. And if we, can't get any, uh, if we can't answer you online, uh, we'll look to try and come back to you offline. So please uh, follow up with an email if you have any questions. Right now, though, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Darren, who's going to take you through some of the material for today. Thank you, Charlie, and welcome, everybody. Um, so it's uh, unprecedented times. It's uh, challenging uh, d information, details, um, data, changing in policy um, are, are, are just changing at a rapid rate. Um, governments, businesses are really trying to manage this evolving situation. But I think it's really important just to take a little bit of a step back and think about you know, how, how am I managing my business and, and am I keeping it safe? And also thinking about the insurance implications of that as well. I think that what has been a, a difficult uh, pr a problem for, for many clients is the changing situation with the insurance market. Whilst originally we saw that the insurance market were happy to provide extensions to policies at renewal, particularly on PDBI policies, um, that's, that message has, has certainly changed over, over the last four weeks. Where, client, where insurers now are requiring um, clients to provide information to allow the renewal to take place. So certainly would urge some consideration of what, do you, what can you do, and we'll talk about these a little bit later as we go through, but what can you do to make sure that you have the right data available to enable your insurer to make an informed decision about setting your premium moving forward. Another point just to uh, really sort of point out and just to be aware of is the is the, the requirement to shut buildings and the implications of that for insurers. Within many policies there'll be a requirement for you to notify your insurer as soon as the site is shut. Some, some policies allow for a 30 day period um, before, the, before notification but many of them will require you to notify your insurer as soon as possible. So I would certainly urge you, if you haven't done already, to, to get in contact with your insurer, speak to your client executive or your client advisor through your broking house and make sure that they are informed that the, the building has shut. I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about some of the general property uh, conservation um, areas that you can consider um, and the things that you should perhaps be looking at on, on my next slide. Um, so, so really, the, 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 the five key areas to consider around this are emergency response plans, site security measures, um, key equipment and utilities, fire protection and prevention measures, um, and making sure that you're communicating effectively. So just going on to the uh, emergency response plans, it's really important that these are kept up to date. Check them, just that if you have access to them, just open them up and just check that they are up to date and relevant to the situation at hand. So if, the, if you have closed your site, make sure that both fire and flood, not just fire, and the disaster recovery plans for both of those are in place. We've been fortunate with the weather, um, so we haven't had to worry about sort of heavy, heavy downpours of rain, etc. But it's still probably more so than ever, heavy 
rain at this time when ground is dry means that sort of runoff water becomes a problem for, for potential flooding. So making sure that you're checking those disaster recovery plans, communication um, systems are in place and that they're effectively working. Also think about drainage systems. You know, as you uh, check your sites, if they're vacant or even if they're, they're, they're occupied on a skeleton staff, um, having a, a regular check of those um, is, is absolutely key. What we're seeing a lot of clients do is, is actually do a two weekly drive by of, of, of their premises just to, just to make sure that they are um, kept secure. And I'll come on to security in, in a second, but making sure fire alarm systems, security alarm systems functioning properly and, and that they're being monitored still and that the monitoring systems, if you're using them, are still being um, observed um, by a, a third party if that's, how you, if that's your system that you've got set up. And also making sure that your building management systems are fully functional. Um, so if you have a remote location facility, for example, make sure that it's logged on to regularly and checked. In terms of site security, think about site intrude alarms and video surveillance systems. Is video being um, recorded? Has it been checked? Um, if you keep a 30-day, if you have a 30-day license to, to, to keep a, a video um, CCTV footage, is that actually still operating and, and um, have you got enough uh, storage space purchased to be able to, to, to maintain that? And really looking at perimeter fences, are they in good condition? Now, has anybody tried to break in? Typically, when people try to break into vacant properties, they monitor those properties over a period of time to really see who is coming on site, if people are on site, and are there, are there times where there's nobody around. So making sure that you, your physical security um, is, is adequate and, and in good condition um, is absolutely key. So no, no gaps at sort of ground level where people can, can crawl through and, and making sure that somebody is going around and checking perimeter doors and windows. What I would urge you to do is record these checks. One of the, the key issues is being able to evidence and demonstrate to the insurance market that you, you discharge your duty of care and you ensured that, every, that the, the premises was kept secure and safe and that doors were locked. It's quite easy where you have security on site for somebody to leave a door open um, and then uh, realise too late and somebody has actually gained access to it when there's not actually that many people around and the emergency services are, are occupied with, with other issues during this lockdown. If you have a security centre, um, make sure that on-call staff are, are, are posted, um, are kept up to date and, and posted on, on all of the emergency service needs. Um, this is really important to make sure they know what to do in an emergency and who to call. And make sure that interior and exterior lighting, particularly night lighting, is still active and still being used. Um, this tends to show that, some, that the building does have some, um, some presence um, and can be a, a really good deterrent for people trying to break in. The other point I would really just make around this is think about some of the more high risk areas of your business. If you have data or service uh, data service, uh, service centers um, in your buildings, um, make sure that those doors are, are kept secure and monitored and maintained so your data within your, your building is also secure. Um, so it's not just about your premises, but it's about what's in the premises that you need to control as well. And think about permanent guarding should be considered unmanned locations. You know, is there a possibility that you can put up fixed bollards? Um, they, you know, like uh, large concrete bollards that can be placed at entrances and exits just to, to prevent people just driving in um, and prevent access. And the other key point that I would make, a uh, big concern for the insurance market at the moment is around, is around fires and unoccupied premises. So making sure combustible materials are removed from the site and minimised so it's not a temptation for uh, arsonists. Other areas to consider is around key equipment and utilities. So making sure that vital facility fuel tanks, for example, where you have uh, backup generators, are topped up with diesel. Um, uh, these are particularly relevant where you've got fire pumps uh, for sprinkler systems and check that the emergency generators are still working. So a, a weekly check of those generators to uh, just to run them up um, and ensure that they're working um, and that you have access to uh, a fuel supply should you need it, uh, particularly in large warehouse locations is, is, is a really good uh, point, point to make. And also think about the isolation of non-essential electrical and water supplies. Can these be cut off? Just on a point around water supplies, 
there are some concerns around um, water supplies and water standing stagnant in pipes. During this time of lockdown, systems won't be um, flushed or, or run and checks probably won't be carried out by any, any supplier for your Legionella and Legionnaires disease checks. So I would consider, consider shutting down and draining down water supplies if that's possible. And if not, think about how can I get my water supply back up to date and make sure that my checks are carried out so that there's no risk of Legionnaires disease when I do start to ramp up and, and prepare to open. And also thinking about keeping a register of drained and isolated, like isolated systems so that if there is an emergency, the emergency services are aware of what is isolated and what is drained should they need to access any type of electrical pumped um, fire system. Making sure that all key equipment is regularly inspected. Um, you may want to think about um, accessing uh, thermographic electrical checks, but that's quite difficult in lockdown, particularly where people are running on, on skeleton staff. But really thinking about your, your documented inf the, the documented information that you have and just reviewing that. Was there anything that was in, in need of repair prior to going into lockdown? And is there anything that you can do about it at this time? Just a point on um, fire protection before I, I move on to, uh, to, to my next slide. Um, I think this is, is quite um, challenging to, to manage. The, the argument is, well, the risk is reduced because I've got nobody working on site. So the, the risk actually comes from electrical systems overheating or arsonists. So really looking at your fire suppression system your, uh, and alarm system to make sure that they're operational and carrying out the regular checks. If you have on-site security, informing the on-site security to run the fire alarm test and record that as necessary. Also making sure that you um, keep uh, your, the effective function of the fire protection and detection systems um, and making sure that a fire uh, weekly test for sprinkler systems, if applicable, is carried out. This is certainly important um, for your insurance where it's a requirement of the insurance to have an active and operational fire system in place. I really, there's, there's so much to talk about and, and I, the one other point that I would make, and this was a really good piece of advice that I recently picked up from an insurer, and that is about making sure that no hot work is being undertaken in the facility um, at the moment. Even if you're operating on a skeleton staff, I would urge you to consider undertaking no hot work in the facility. Um, this is not so much the to do with the fact that, um, that hot work is, is generally just a high hazard uh, risk and, and a concern for insurers, but it's also about the, emerg the availability of the emergency services to be able to attend your tight in a, in a timely manner, to be able to address any concern that might come, come of that. So just um, moving forward, I really wanted to talk about some of the work that we're doing with clients at the moment. I spoke at the, at the beginning about insurers really um, pushing quite hard to have access to the right information to, to make informed decisions about, um, about premium setting on, on uh, PDBI policies. We, um, we, we've done quite a bit of work and continue to work with clients to help address this, to make sure that access to this information is available, to, to enable them to place the risk into the market, but also give some confidence to the insurance market that the risk is being managed. We've started to undertake remote surveys and we've been speaking to a number of insurance companies about you know, how would they perceive this information. Um, the, 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 the feedback that we've had is, is, is varied, but one of the things that we've had to slightly adapt around this is about validation of the data. Whilst insurers will be happy to use remote survey data um, in making decisions about uh, property renewals, etc., they would like some some uh, confirmation and uh, validation of the information that we collect. So what we're actually doing is, is, is working with clients, clients are sharing with us uh, place uh, uh, drawings, um, previous survey reports, uh, claims details, some insured um, pr uh, information in advance. We then set up a web call uh, with the client to talk through the, uh, the, the, the information that we've got and start to work through the plan and understand whether anything has changed from the, the, the previous survey, if one was available. But where one wasn't, we can collect sort of standard COPE data construction and operation data, which is, is useful in, in placing risk into the market. 
We can also carry out separate virtual site tours. Whilst we are in lockdown, there is, there is still an argument that, um, that work can be done and we have all of the controls in place to actually keep people safe um, as, as we do that. So we have the procedures to make sure that, that we maintain social distancing, for example. And we can do this and we can do the site uh, tours by webcast, by streaming technology, uh, FaceTime on, 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 uh, on um, iPhones and iPads, etc. Um, and also using CCTV footage um, as, as evidence of the actual risk and using this as a great way to be able to validate this, this type of data that we want to place into the market. We then carry out a closeout meeting at a later time and discuss any risk improvements, clarify any information. And again, this might, this might require us to come and do a validation audit at the end of it, but that doesn't stop us submitting the information to the insurance market and discussing with you what that actually looks like. We can get, uh, so we, we then use our consultants to produce desktop reports um, and we include loss estimates in that based on the previous information. I really wanted to just sort of jump forward um, and talk about some of the other work that we're doing um, around uh, recommendation support. We are a team, we're, we're, we're a large team, uh, can support globally. Um, we're a team of over 900 people across the world. So we can actually provide support in any country that you're based in. Um, within the UK, we have, a, we have a team of 12 people that are dedicated on, on, on property and project uh, support. And, we can, and we're more than happy to take calls with you, support you as much as we can um, at this time, and develop, help develop site emergency plans, for example. Um, NAPCAT is a big driver of cost of uh, PDBI insurance at the moment, and there's work that we can do and modeling work that we can do to support you around that. And we can also help develop best practice documents. We have access to a huge portfolio of information. We work very closely with insurers and we work closely with some of the leading insurers on property standards. So we can actually work to help, to help build best practice documents for when we come out of lockdown and we start to start to move forward, we actually, um, we're actually starting to build a, a, a profile for you, which makes you a risk of choice um, and uh, make you uh, a, a keen interest of insurers to underwrite your risk moving forward. And we can also provide support and planning visits and stewardship support work for future renewals. As I keep mentioning, the insurance market is going through a tough time and, and COVID-19 has come at a time when the market was already stretched to uh, capacity and we've seen, const we've seen constriction in, in the, the, the number of um, policies being placed around property and premiums going up. Now is a good time to start thinking about what you can do to manage your profile with those insurers and help try and drive and manage the premium setting at the point of renewal, whether your renewal's next year or whether your renewal's in three months time. There's, work, there's a lot of work that you can do to help argue your point and present yourself as a risk of choice. Another point I really wanted to just move on to uh, was around uh, valuations, plant and, and machinery valuations. A question that we're often asked is, um, is my, are my valuations accurate? Am I, under, am I underinsured? Am I overinsured? So we're doing a lot of work with clients. And again, we can do this desk, desktop remotely um, without having to access site buildings. Um, we, as long as we have access to plans and building dimensions, but we do have other ways to be able to work around that. But making sure that your valuations are correct, we see a lot of talk around um, just adding 2.5% year on year to the valuations. But realistically, there is a point at which you probably or maybe overvaluing your, your portfolio of, of, of properties and paying too much insurance, um, which is not really necessary. There's a flip side to that. It's about making sure that you're paying enough because your insurer will only pay out on insured values. So if you are underinsured and you have a loss, you will not be able to insure to the full reinstatement value of, of the property. We can deliver the reinstatement um, cost assessments to you um, and, and maintain the certain necessary social distancing between surveyors and site staff. An interesting point for, uh, to note was the change in the government's position around the relaxing of, of rules around fire, for example, and statutory inspections. When it originally started, key work uh, uh, risk surveyors were not deemed to be uh, key workers. 
which was a big challenge and received quite a lot of pushback as, as, as organizations, companies found that enforcing authorities were saying that we will not relax the regulations and rules around fire safety, around health and safety, around property safety and, uh, and maintenance safety. So things like passenger lifts, goods lifts, uh, lifting equipment and machinery such as forklift trucks and other systems as well, such as pressure systems, need to be maintained continuously with no relaxing of the regulations. So the, regulate, so the rules changed for that um, as advised by um, Public Health England and the government in that risk uh, engineers were deemed to be key workers. So there is still the opportunity to have these under, under, undertaken, but we are hearing from, from the likes of, of Zurich, um, Allianz, RSA, et cetera, who carry out statutory engineering inspections. We are hearing that they are working uh, to a skeleton staff. So I would urge you to prioritize any key pieces of equipment that require statutory inspection and make sure that they are being given priority, particularly as you start to run up and think about reopening your, your, your uh, property. I didn't really have much more to talk about in terms of um, in, in terms of detail. There is so much to consider. <clears throat> My key point would be is to making is, is to make sure that you you record and monitor everything. Keeping records is a great way to evidence to insurers that you are discharging your duty of care. And should a claim need to be made, it's evidence that you've done everything that was required that your in insurance policy states. So. Uh, my, my, my key message and the, the thing to really leave you with um, today is just making sure that you monitor and keep those records of fire checks, fire alarm checks, checks on your sprinkler systems, the, the run-up systems, uh, checking the pumps, ensuring that um, systems that, that um, provide power to those pumps, such as diesel generators, are topped up and working and check them regularly. I'm going to hand back to Charlie now just for a, um, a close off um, and, uh, and look at some of the questions that we've had from, um, from the participants. Uh, so thank you very much and back to you, Charlie. Thank you, Darren. That concludes the main part of our presentation. Um, we'll move into questions now. We've had a good number come through as we've been talking, but please, you can continue to submit questions now and uh, I'll ask them to Darren. So Darren, here's, uh, here's one for you. Uh, the first question I've had today is, we've been increasing our property values on a percentage basis for a number of years. Um, how do we sense check whether that's accurate or not? So uh, thanks, Charlie. So that is an absolutely great question. One of the things that we've found is organisations uh, are, are typically just adding two and a half, three percent year on year to their property portfolio. What we can do to help with that is actually do a centre check. That doesn't require us to go and do a valuation of every single property. But what we can do is actually band out your properties by value and do some sample validation checking of individual sites calculate what the difference is between the percentage value that you have pitched it at and the valuation that we have come to, come, come to through, our, through, our, through a RICS uh, process. And then apply that percentage difference across your portfolio to give more accuracy about whether you are, are right with your valuation or, or wrong with it and work within a banding to be able to provide that. Thank you, Darren. That's a... Uh... As a, a thorough answer to the question. So I've got a, um, a slightly complicated one that's come in here um, where uh, one, of our, uh, one of our listeners today has um, most of their staff on furlough and their stores are vacant. Mm -hmm. And they, the issue they have is that the, the key holders um, are therefore on lockdown. Some of them don't have their own transport. Um, how do they how do they get to the store to even carry out tasks and and how how um, how, how should our listener judge between um, putting employees at risk by asking them to travel to the store and uh, and making sure that the vacant property is being uh, being looked after right so uh, that, that's quite a complex uh, complex question with, with quite a complex answer I would first of all start by looking at your property um, as a risk is it high risk or is it low risk if it's a retail environment then typically it's going to be relatively low risk so I think that that needs to be that needs to be considered in the process the second thing that I would um, consider is actually a 
actually doing an assessment of the risk of someone actually going to that premises. What would be the benefits? Now, if the person um, cannot access the, 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 the building because they, they don't have any their own transport and they need to use public transport, public transport is still running. My point would be that the duty of care on you as the employer still needs to be discharged to that employee. So if that employee needs to travel to the site, you as the employer must do everything reasonably practical to protect that employee employee from contracting COVID-19 and your safety is, is uh, their safety is absolutely your priority. So I think my, my answer to that would be consider the risk of the risk to the property. Is it high risk or is it low risk? Understand what the frequency of those checks are. Establish procedures that the employee should follow if they do need to use public transport make available things like hand sanitizer that i'm not suggesting that you give them hand sanitizer but it might be that they can buy hand sanitizer and then claim the cost back from from, from the company and then actually get there to, to actually do the inspection but i would i would urge you to consider the the, the risk within the property um, if it's a large multi multi-floor um, store for example then the risk will be higher but making sure that you've got the controls in place to protect the person i'm not sure if I've really answered the, char the, the question, uh, Charlie, because that, that was quite a, a long answer, but it has to be risk-based would be, would be my, my um, summary of it. Thank you, Darren. And the listener also added that uh, they're, in a, um, uh, they're in shopping centres where centre security don't want to hold the store keys, so they couldn't ask the, um, they, they couldn't ask the, the centre to do these checks on their behalf. Yeah. And also that they've informed their insurers about the situation, which sounds like very sensible steps uh, to me. It does indeed. And I think that if there is any doubt whatsoever, speak to your insurer. The insurer's policy wording will be specific to your business and all policies are slightly different. So I would always, always check with the insurer and ask the question about how they would suggest that you proceed with it. Great, thanks, Dan. I had another question come in. Um, this one: We need some support working through our recommendations to ensure we spend our um, our capex in the right area, particularly at this time when um, when they're when they're looking to ensure that they that they optimise their capex spend and be, you know be, be very careful about where they're spending. Um, how should they think about this? So reach out to us. Um, we're here to help you. Um, we're here to support you. Whether you're a client of Marshall or not, we have a team of people that can support and help you and a team of experts that specialise in this type of work. So pick up the phone and um, speak to us and we'll support you wherever we can. And you know, we can work on projects with you to help understand where that capex should be spent and how, um, how valuable that, you know, what the, what the opportunities are for you um, to ensure that it's spent in the right way. Thank you, Darren. Uh, one here asking, do we provide advice on what FM preventative maintenance schedules should be in place for compliance? Yes, we can provide all of that information. Um, where we are very fortunate is our, both our property um, and our health and safety team work, in, can work side by side. So we can provide full guidance on FM standards that you need to apply. Um, so two questions here on sort of partial shutdown. I'll, I'll group them together for you. So the first is, um, if the premises is only part, partially shut down, i.e. certain portions are shut down, other portions still operating because it's an essential service, um, do they still need to notify the insurer? And also related to this, um, if a lift or lifting equipment is uh, due a statutory inspection, but an insurer in Sorry, but insurer engineers are unable or unwilling to carry out the inspection should the equipment be used or closed off. So both of these sort of relating to partial closure and then right. the necessity for statutory inspections. OK, so so in terms of the building, I'll address that issue, that question first, and I will come back to statutory inspections because it's slightly more complex in terms of the property. If the building is connected to another part of the building which is closed off. So you might be working in a warehouse attached to a retail outlet out front, for example, but the retail outlet is closed, but you're working in the back, that still becomes one premises. If the premises is separate and sits separate on any insurance policy, the part of that premises that is closed, if it relates to a separate insurance policy or a, sh a separate reinstatement value, then yes, you should notify the insurer as that would become unoccupied. 
but if it's all under one building and is listed as one premises with one reinstatement value and you still have people operating in there you do not need to let the insurer know on the point around statutory inspections um, the simple answer is should you use lifts if they haven't been statutory inspected the answer is absolutely not the health and safety executive have been absolutely clear in the application of the lifting operation, lifting equipment regulations and the provision of use, of use and work equipment regulations in that statutory inspections are still required and there'll be no relaxing of, of regulations or health and safety irrespective of the current situation. So if you're, there are other organizations out there that can undertake statutory inspections. Again, I would speak to your insurer who holds your engineering policy and ask them what they advise but certainly I would shut off any equipment that you cannot have statutory inspected and do not allow it to be used. This might be a real challenge if you're using passenger lifts in a, in a manufacturing plant, for example, um, because you operate on mezzanine levels um, and you have uh, disabled staff, for example, and you need to provide access, then you need to think about how can I actually just relocate those individuals so they don't have to use the passenger lift or speak to your statutory inspector and say, this is a vital piece of equipment and it's critical to the function of our business. And I absolutely you have to have it um, inspected. There are third parties out there, such as Bureau Veritas, for example, uh, British Engineering Systems BS, who, who actually provide these, these outside of it. But uh, that, would, that would only incur additional cost for you. Um, but just to be absolutely clear, if an item of equipment has not been statutory inspected, then it should not be used. Thank you. Uh, more questions coming in now about statutory equipment. Seems like it's a, it's a very topical um, uh, issue for people. So is there any mitigation if you record in the site logbook that you are unable to inspect statutory equipment during lockdown and have isolated the plant awaiting availability of inspectors? So um, as long as that equipment is locked down and cannot be used, and I mean physically locked off with a padlock or shut or have the power to it shut down so it cannot be used, it's absolutely fine to lock it off, make a note in the logbook, um, and then not use it until it can be statutory inspected. There is absolutely no leeway um, in using, so if a item of equipment, perhaps, I don't know, was ran over by one month um, past its due date, and that equipment was used, even though you had logged the fact that you had called a statutory inspector, inspector and you had an incident, you will be held liable under whichever regulation will apply, whether that's the provision and use of work equipment regulations or the lifting operations lifting equipment regulations. You will be held liable because the, the duty is absolute. Thank you, Darren. A question here from one of our charity clients. Um, we're a charity 125 years old, heritage funicular, 400 metre twin track tramway, run yeah. entirely by volunteers and yeah. closed, with, yeah. but with no paid or professional employees. Are we expected to maintain inspection levels and records of the business where we have no personnel dedicated to do this? Um, if, the, if the system is used, uh, is, is maintained by a volunteer, they then become, in law, your employee. Whilst you might not pay them, a volunteer is still an employee of the company because you control the activity of that individual. So my, my, uh, if, this, if the system is not, we're on lockdown. So I suppose my, uh, my, my point would be that nobody is going out to be able to use it. So there's no reason why you can't um, just lock it down and then have it inspected prior to opening. That would be my adv advice on that. But the point around volunteers is volunteers, there is an, there is an argument around the, the level of control that you have as a, as a charity over those volunteers, but volunteers are in essence um, under your control and therefore the Health and Safety at Work Act and all of the requirements for statutory inspection apply. Okay, yet more questions about statutory inspections here. Uh, so what about lifting equipment such as ceiling hoists in domestic property where inspectors will not go into the property for social distancing reasons, but the equipment must be used for the health of the patient in the home? Right, okay, so um, in a, so th this is quite an unusual one because it's a dom domestic property. 
Um, so under the Health and Safety at Work Act, the requirement for lifting equipment and uh, under lifting operations, lifting equipment regulations um, does not apply to domestic premises. However, the, as a, I'm assuming this relates to a care worker going into the premises to use the equipment. My, my answer to that question would be that the individual would be considered as a vulnerable worker and would be seen as a critical piece of equipment to ensure the well-being, safety and health of that individual in, in, in their own home. If the statutory inspector will not enter the domestic premises because of social distancing um, requirements, I would contact your point of contact at your insurer who provides your policy, um, your engineering policy, and explain the situation to them and explain that this is critical to ensure the safety, health and well-being of the individual in the care home and that this, this needs to be monitored. My view is that there would be some very unique circumstances where, um, where, the, the, where the enforcing authorities would perhaps take a less um, robust position on this type of thing, and I think this is this is one of those. Um, but that's not really for for that's not for me to decide. That would only be for a court to decide. But I certainly would be speaking to my um, my engineering policy provider and explaining the situation and saying that this is a critical system. No, thank you, Dan. Very very sensible advice. Uh, a couple more questions. I think we've got time for now. Um, our offices are open via FOB access. Should employees want to come on site to collect mail, etc., there are no employees working in the office full time. Uh, where does this leave us with insurance compliance? And I'll caveat that by saying, Darren, that obviously without you seeing the policy itself, it's hard for you to advise on the specific. Mm. But in the in the general, do you have a do you have an answer to that? Um, I my my, my advice is speak to your insurer. Speak to, you, speak to your broker first. Um, the broker will be able to review the policy wording for you. Um, and then if, if we're unable to, to, unable to answer the question, we can speak to the insurer on your behalf. But I certainly would recommend that you, there is, you only need to do what is reasonably practicable. You can only discharge your duty of care to a certain level. And I think as long as you have fulfilled that and achieved that, I think that you've done everything that, that could reasonably be expected of you. Uh, but I, and that would be my answer. But I, my, my, my sort of caveat to that would be speak to your, speak to your client advisor, speak to your, your client executive at your broking, if you insure direct, speak to your insurer and ask the question because the policy wording may be written in a way that it includes um, warranties um, or exclusions within the policy that could, that, that, that could cause a problem should you need to make a claim um, further on down the line. Thank you, Darren. And there's two questions that have come in here that I think are, are best referred to our um, insurance broking specialists, but I'll, I'll raise them now because I think they're, they're, they're interesting for the for the group to hear. The first is our car insurers have given us back £25 per vehicle as they're not being used so much at this time. Our buildings are being used. Will we receive refunds or future reductions? Another question very similar to that. If a manufacturing site has been temporarily shut down for a period, say six months, would the BI element of the PDBI cover respond in the event of a major fire? If the BI element would not respond because the site is not generating revenue, should we be looking for a refund on premium for this period? Now, again, I'll carry it by saying you're not the right person for the, to, to direct these questions to. Um, but can you maybe comment on, you know, yeah. you know we're seeing these questions, um, you know, we, we can't yeah. give advice on this specifically, but any thoughts you've got? Absolutely. So I'm going to take the first question. I'm aware that, um, that uh, Car, car insurers are providing some rebate uh, where they're not allowed. Uh, I think it was Admiral yesterday announced um, that they will be providing a 25% rebate um, on insurance policies. We actually checked that uh, yesterday um, th through, our, through our Norwich office with the, uh, some of the key fleet underwriters. They will not be providing rebates or discounts on motor policies moving forward. Now that's what one insurer said whether that will be all of insurers we don't know but certainly the, the the message came back is we are aware that domestic insurers are providing rebates on car insurance but that but in checking 
it was not the message that was coming from the insurance market on commercial fleets. Um, so I, 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 I would doubt that we'll see any re rebate from that. On the point around BI, I, that you're absolutely right, Charlie, that's, that's a question for our, for our broking team. My point would be is to refer back to your policy wording. BI policy wordings are very specific and very, very unique. You need to look at your policy wording on a case-by-case -case basis to understand whether the policy would, would pay out, but certainly something to uh, refer back to, to um, one of our brokers. Darren, thank you very much. I think that's all the time that we've got uh, today. Uh, if you did have other questions we weren't able to get to, please do email us them to the team. And similarly, on those two questions that were very specifically about policy response, uh, please contact your, uh, your insurance broking um, uh, partner at Marsh directly um, or, um, or send them to us and we can, we can redirect them to the, to the right team for you. Um, Darren, thank you so much for participating. Sure. Um, we, we got through a, a, a large number of questions, so, uh, um, so that's always great to, to be able to do. And thank you everyone for joining us in what's um, you know, surely a very busy time for, for all of us. Uh, we will be sending out a replay to everybody who registered. That will come out early next week. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to your Marsh representative if you have any questions or concerns. Um, as, you, um, as we continue to work through the outbreak. And for any more information or resources that you need, please visit our COVID-19 resource hub on marsh.com slash UK. Here you'll find our current thought leadership offering solutions and advice. And you can also stay up to date on Marsh News by following Marsh Global on Twitter. And don't forget to visit our events page on marsh.com slash UK to register for our upcoming risk management webcasts. The next part is our, our risk profile changes in the new world. That's taking place at noon on Tuesday the 28th. So thank you all for joining us again today and please stay safe.